What I am trying to do is earn your trust so that when we get to these super long cont video coming up, you will I will have earned some debt. <laughs> so, short video. What I want to do here is I simply want to tell a bunch of stories to kind of get these images and illustrations in your head so that I think you'll have a more profitable time reading the Virginia Held and Nell Nodding's articles. Let's say that you happen to find yourself walking through my neighborhood. You are not coming to visit me. I mean, why would you? But you just hear my voice. And yes, I know my voice is awful, but it's really identifiable. Anyway, so you're walking by my house and you hear me yelling. Now, you peer over to my side yard because you hear some really odd noises. You hear me saying things like, ha ya, take that, yeah, ha, right, <laughs> whatever. And so you peek around the side and you look over the fence and you see me wielding a sword. And I'm shouting all these things like a good martial arts movie. Yeah, take that, you suck, right? Fine. Now, at first, you're going, okay, Jeff, that just makes sense, right? I totally could see you doing that. But when you walk more closely and get a better perspective, you see that I am not just wielding a sword doing some cosplay or, sorry, what do you call that? Oh, yeah, yeah, LARPing. So you think I'm LARPing or something. But you look more closely and you see that what I'm actually doing is I have large life-size cutouts of all of you and I'm using a sword to cut your heads off. Now, morally you would say, I'm not doing anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with using a sword to cut off some cardboard pictures, right? But you would still say, there's something wrong with me. N now, maybe you would put it in moral terms or maybe you'd put it in psychological terms. Or you would say, who would do that? Who would imagine they're chopping the heads off their students? I mean, these are real people and that's just macabre and makes sense because Jeff's a nutter, but something's wrong with Jeff. Something is morally wrong with Jeff, probably. All right, story one. Story two. You are watching your own little toddler. Maybe this is a nephew or a cousin or something, but okay, you're hanging out with a stupid toddler. They're all stupid. No, no offense. Toddlers are great, but they're dumb. And this toddler hits a puppy, right? What the heck? All right, now fine. What do you do? Do you just say, you're a terrible person, I hate you? No. Do you weigh the measures of pleasure and pain of the happiness of the puppy and the toddler and give them the utilitarian calculation? Do you simply tell them, that is wrong, that's not the right thing to do? I don't think so, right? Because toddlers are stupid, but we care more about toddlers. And so what do you do? Most likely what you do is you say, oh, no, no. Don't hurt the puppy, that makes the puppy sad. And you would probably mimic how we should treat puppies. And then you might explain something about, look, look how much the puppy likes it when we pet him instead of hit him. Look at its little tail wag, and look how he curls up next to us. Now notice how it makes us happy when we see the puppy happy. Notice what you would do. Again, an ethics of care, not an ethics of rules or obligations, this is natural caring ethics. Now let's try three shorter scenarios. Uh, you are on your way to get something to eat and a beggar comes up to you and asks for a dollar. Now, just give yourself a chance to look into kind of the emotional narrative that's going on in your head. First, if you're like me, you would say, oh, oh, I feel bad, I should help, but oh, no, wait, I don't want to give money away. And then you have all these maxims, these little principles you use. But notice how you feel bad for saying no. You might have plenty of good reasons, but you just have that nag, right? That nag in your head saying, that would be the right thing to do. But your response is kind of a rejection and kind of almost a little offense, like, oh, you shouldn't be just asking people for money. That is something that, you know, makes people uncomfortable. Fine. Now, let's pretend you're in a classroom. You're in class and someone, you know, you've been in there a few weeks, right? Say this is our ethics class and we've been meeting in person instead of online. And the person that normally sits behind you says, hey, excuse me, could I borrow a pen? Now, notice how you respond to that and how different it is for the beggar. Now, of course, you might say, who doesn't have a pen, right? 
And if you look and you see that their pen stopped writing, you totally forgive that. Oh, they did come prepared. And what do you want to do? If you have the extra pen, the most common response would be to lend it to them, right? Oh, no problem here. I've got an extra. Now notice how different that is. Yes, it is a pen and it's not money and I get this changes and the context is different. It's outside versus in the classroom. But notice how this kind of feeling of obligation changes. Lastly, you are on your way to lunch or let's say in a classroom or whatever, wherever you are, and a little child that has been, looks very sad, like they've probably been crying and they have a very weepy, desperate sound in their voice. And you can tell, right? Now, they, let's say they don't even approach you, just you just see them up there. And what do you find? Well, they're obviously lost. Now, how do you respond to this? Well, any normal person feels compelled to help. Now notice, would you lend them a pen as a lost child if they needed one? Sure. Because the obligation you feel to someone that's so vulnerable and so sad and so innocent, sorry, is very compelling and it's an obligation. This is an obligation of the strongest sort. In fact, I would go so far as to say that pen is theirs because they might need it. If you have water, you might offer it to them because you feel the obligation so strongly that my job right now, you might say, is to help them, help them find their parent, help them not feel afraid. This is all normal, the normal sympathies we feel in everyday situations. And I would say that these are the kind of sympathetic responses that the vast majority of ethical viewpoints and ethical theories can't capture. So this is why we have care ethics. Sometimes people would refer to this as a feminist ethics or something like this, but I'm going to group these all together. Now, these are in the realm of an Aristotle virtue ethics because they are very much contextual and they're based on what different practices you find yourself within. But I like these a lot better than Aristotle because they do have more moral norm language to them because they are based on things that do carry these natural responses of obligation or compassion or something like this. And so they're less prone to this relativism that so haunts a virtue ethics normally. All right, so really quick, let me just read a few lines from Virginia Hell's article. And I take this article to be something close to defining an ethics of care, showing what it is, and showing how distinct it is from other sorts of ethics. So let me just read a quick line, first, second paragraph of the piece. First, the central fo focus of the ethics of care is on the compelling moral salience of attending to and meeting the needs of the particular others for whom we take responsibility. Now, this is something that I take as my whole kind of social political worldview. I think we can create a very good moral theory out of we have a somewhat of a responsibility to see other human beings flourish. When we're trying to decide on policies for healthcare or prisons, I think we should look at what are the general traits that make human beings flourish and which ones denigrate them and disrespect them and cause them to not do well. Fine. So what do we get? And so we would get this idea that, yes, I can see myself in other people and what do these people need? Well, they need food and shelter. They need to feel safe and secure. But then I would go to more of their psychological, sociological needs as well. And so I would say, what do people need? People are like me. What do we need? The freedom to express our ideas. The freedom to express what we think and feel. They need to feel acceptance and belonging. We need to feel like we have a purpose or meaning in life. And we need love. We need people to care for us and we need to care for others. And so I think you can really build a full ethic out of this. This is how we should treat one another. And notice, I would say this is one that gets close to a love ethic. To go back to again to a religious ethic, if your ethic is based on loving others as you love yourselves or another one, a real golden rule ethic, I think this is how you build one. Now notice, let me be careful. Very few people understand the difference between what the golden rule actually says and how to carry it out. Most people are confused and they take it to be the silver rule, although they don't say this. 
The golden rule says, do for others as you would have them do for you. It's not passive. A silver rule might say, don't treat others as you would want to be treated. Now notice, that is a negative sort of compulsion. It tells you what not to do. Well, that's kind of how most ethics is based. Most ethics is based on this idea of, I would need to avoid sinning, for example. Notice, when people think of, say, Christian ethics, they think the good person is the one that doesn't sin. No, that's neutral. That makes you someone in a coma. That doesn't make you a good person. A good person actively seeks to help others. Now let me read another line toward the end of the second paragraph in the Held article. Morality is built on the image of the independent, autonomous, she's making fun of Kant right there, rational individual, largely overlooked the reality of human dependence and the morality for which it calls. A couple stories here. I am often quick to say that the feminine, the female women, are typically better perspectives and have better moral instincts than the masculine, the, the men. Now, what I mean by this is masculine identities are typically built around this idea that I am independent, I take pride in the number of people I can boss around, I don't need anyone. Now notice, that is the reverse of what I refer to as a feminine identity. Doesn't have to be male, female, even though statistically it might you know, overlap pretty well, but I would hope to be myself more feminine in my identity than masculine. Now, what does this mean? The feminine identity doesn't take pride in being independent. It takes pride in the number of people that can depend on you, the number of people that see you as part of a resource of care for them. Uh, a little tangent. My buddy once showed me the marketing materials for different cars, and it was fascinating. He showed me the marketing materials for people who would buy a Hummer. And so it's, these are marketing materials you use for advertising Hummers to people or you're trying to sell a Hummer in a dealership. Well, what is the archetype for the Hummer person purchaser? Here's a quote. I want to know that if I run into something, I win. Oh, gosh, that is so immoral. Now, flip this script to minivans. How do you market a minivan? What kind of a person is thinking of buying a minivan? Well, here's the quote, right? I want to know that I have room for whoever I might be taking care of. I have room for wheelchairs. I have room for the neighbor's kids. I want to know that I can meet the needs of everyone I care about. <laughs> Damn. Couldn't be more different. Now, I know you make fun of, make fun of minivans. Stop it, right? You should be making fun of big trucks and, and hummers, right? Sorry, around my family, we call them penis extensions. Sorry, but you get it, right? But it is fun, right? If I'm trying to park my little car somewhere and there's a huge truck overlapping both sides of the parking space, I usually make a remark like, oh, sorry, your penis extension is getting in my way. Here, I'll try to make some room. Fine, all right, sorry. One more part of this and then a few more stories. Uh, third paragraph, third line. Not all emotion is valued, of course, but in contrast with the dominant rationalist approaches, such emotions as sympathy, empathy, sensitivity, and responsiveness are seen as the kind of moral emotions that need to be cultivated. Notice, and now you get back to acquiring virtues, like in what we said about Aristotle. These are emotions that need to be cultivated not only to help in the implementation of the dictates of reason, but to better, better ascertain what morality recommends. Notice, Kant will be very anti-emotion, but this has room for the kinds of emotions that actually inspire us to care for others. Let me explain. An, ethics of care, an ethic of care, or a feminist conception of ethics, notice, has room for this idea that we feel strongly toward people that are vulnerable. We find things that are weak or vulnerable extra attractive. We want to care for them. I love the fact that one of my dogs is very nervous and very needy because it makes me extra happy to make him feel comfortable and make him feel cared for. He's very nervous because of whatever little childhood he had, but it makes me extra happy to, to seek him out and give him care because I know he needs it so much. I would go so far as to say that 
Human moral progress is based on our ability to see more things as like us, to look at things that are vulnerable and see them as part of our object of devotion and sympathy. I don't think it's necessarily that our ethics has changed through the years. I think it's simply that we see more and more things as objects of sympathy. I mean, go back into not so long ago, and we would say that a big key to racial progress is seeing other races as like us. I think a lot of the hurdles when it comes to promoting a more ethical perspective and improving our society is simply seeing more and more people as similar to yourself. I think this is the sign of the vast strides that we've made in gay rights over the last just two generations. I think it has simply been more people are realizing how normal it is to be gay and that you yourself could easily be gay and you see that, oh, geez, my uncle is gay. I didn't know he was. And so this normalcy of not changing how you think ethically, but realizing I haven't been including people who are gay in my normal moral sympathies. And as soon as I do so, it changes your whole perspective on things. And then you start to think about how embarrassing... We People in a society like ours treated other races, treated women, treated animals. I mean, this is moral progress, getting to apply our sort of sympathies to new identities. Okay, and now let me just say a few things about the Nell Noddings piece. Again, pretty easy to read. Let me just tell some stories to make this clearer. Now, I would say Noddings is a nerdy articulation of our normal moral feelings. So we're talking about these natural sympathies we have. Well, Noddings is going to try to articulate them very carefully, right? Brilliant. All right, so let me first read the third paragraph. When my infant cries in the night, I not only feel that I must do something, but I want to do something. Because I love this child, because I am bonded to him, I want to remove his pain as I would want to remove my own. The most intimate situations of caring are thus natural. I do not feel that, sorry, I do not feel that taking care of my own child is moral, but rather natural. And she goes on to say, if someone doesn't feel this way, if someone neglects their child and watches them starve or abuses them, we want to say this is not only immoral, but something is wrong with them. Something is genetically unhealthy or psychotic about such a person because caring this way about people close to you is the most natural thing in the world. If you want to read a really fun book that dissects this in the neuropsychology of it, read Goleman's Social Intelligence. It talks about mirror neurons and how our brain is naturally wired to reach out and care for people that experience pain. It's just what we do. What do we do in society? We talk ourselves out of this natural response of caring. We talk ourselves to, no, don't reach out and help that person. It might be a trap and we become these cold and callous people. But anyway. But then contrast that with how you feel when you're approached by a beggar. And so notice this idea. Nodding is trying to color what is going on in our sympathies. And so she would say, what is this difference? Someone approaches me and I almost feel bad, but at the same time, I'm annoyed. Because you shouldn't be asking me because you're playing with my emotions in a way. And I feel like I need to help but I know I can't help everyone. And so I have this kind of moral or emotional awkwardness. Now, what she will say, it is we can color these different emotions by looking at the relationship we have to that person. When the student in the classroom asks for a pen, notice we have an ongoing relationship. We know we're gonna see them again. We have some shared identity as being members of this class. And so the obligation is one that moves us to act. If we feel that a relationship is already existing and it's already a caring and emotional part of who we are, then of course, it's a natural caring. We help because we want to and we know we should and even calling a should is almost offensive. Oh, you should take care of your child. What the hell? Of course I'm gonna take care of my child. Of course I'm gonna take care of my little dog here and not let them be neglected. This is part of me. It's not a should, it's I have to because I'm not a psychopath, right? You get the idea. But so notice we have this kind of spectrum between what relationships we already have and the chance for what she'll call a reciprocity of a growing relationship. Will the relationship become a back and forth and will become someone in your circle of relationships? 
Well, I think that does a pretty good job of, of expressing when our sympathies are the strongest. I'll leave the rest of the details to you because, again, these are well-written, these are modern works, not ancient Aristotle, right? So you'll be able to read these fine. But let's do what we do with each moral theory. Let's apply them to our four moral, moral issues. All right, so first, uh, murder. What would an ethics of care say about murder? What would our natural sympathies and our natural ideas of relationships and obligations have? What would they say about murder? Of course, it's going to be the most vile thing you can imagine. Who would murder a human being when you see human beings like you and having the same needs and emotions and things that you have? You can't kill one. I mean, the golden rule makes this obvious, but it's just barbaric to think, and we do. In this sort of perspective, you start to say, you would have to be, there would have to be something wrong, for you, wrong with you for you to be able to kill another human being. That's exactly right. What about suicide? Here is a case where we really start to accept the subtlety of some suicide cases. Let me share something about how I myself would view this. Let's say that I am in a situation where I would really find the possibility of, of killing myself. What is, what is an easy case here? What if I am near death? I will not recover. My life is just overwhelmingly one of pain. Notice. I wouldn't simply take just this basic utilitarian stance on it, and I wouldn't be an egomaniac that just thinks only about myself. I would, and this is quite literally how I think about these things, I would make sure that all of the people I'm responsible for and all the people that care about me and I care about are ready for me to let go. I would make sure, okay, you guys, I'm in a lot of pain. Can you please let me go? Can you please let me die? because my life is pretty harsh right now. I would make sure I fulfilled all my obligations and that they are ready and that I would make sure that I have their consent. It's not about my consent, I have mine. It's about the consent of the relationships I'm in. That is the kind of suicide that an ethics of care would allow. And I think we should. Lying. Can we see lying being allowed in certain ca cases? Not in very many cases, because lying is detrimental to these relationships we have. But are there cases? Again, let's go to my weird sort of maxims. How do I think of lying? I think of lying as I, I, I don't like lying. I mean, I had to learn how to lie as part of being married. I am not good at this. But I realize that sometimes we do want to protect people's feelings. But I have this weird maxim, right? I'll share it again with Kant. But it's this idea that I can only lie if the person really knows that I'm lying and would want me to. And when they find out I lied, again, they probably already know it because they expect it. But when they find out I lie, I have to be sure that they would say they would absolutely approve of the lie I told. So this is going to be incredibly rare, but it is going to be things like, what do I think of my daughter's new little shirt or something? You know, I might hate it. <laughs> I think it's dumb, but I'm going to lie. And if she finds out I lied about it, it would, the lie is only allowed if I know that she would say, yep, yeah, that was nice of you. You were a good dad, <laughs> right? That's it. Abortion. Now notice. Noddings is going to go through an abortion case, so let me just give you the highlights of it. Notice, in a normal pregnancy, you are welcoming a child into relationships of care. And you see that as this child grows inside of you, you see this as a growing relationship as the baby grows. And you start to think of this future potential reciprocity. I will care for this thing. It will be made happy by my caring for it. And so now notice how easy this becomes. You wouldn't even think of being able to abort such a child because it is one that is being welcomed in to these reciprocal relationships of care. But now notice, we can just as well imagine a very tragic sort of pregnancy where the relationship to, let's say, the father, right, 
is one that isn't welcoming, doesn't have reciprocity. It's one based on tragedy and loss and even fear, maybe abuse. And you would say in these kinds of situations, that child is not seen that same way, is not seen as something that will grow in its reciprocity, but as one that is welcomed into a very jilted sort of relationship. And you could see how different you would perceive this. Now notice, for those of you who have a very pro-life sort of stance, notice, do you feel obligated to every beggar that approaches you on the street? Now, yes, you feel it, but you don't act on it. You would say in some of these cases, no, I am right to refuse to feel obligated. Well, notice, nodding is, noddings is painting a very similar picture of different pregnancies. When it comes to some pregnancies, you see this as an ongoing relationship, and so of course, it's natural and good to protect that thing, right? Protect that fetus from any sort of harm. But notice, we don't feel that same way toward all human beings. If this person is asking too much of us, or we see it as being a part of a circle of relationships that is mostly negative and detrimental to our other relationships, we don't feel that same sense of obligation. I hope that makes sense.